integration under very specific historical conditions of two distinct traditions of understanding or representing God, namely God okay. as a God as Elohim, yeah. which is the idea that Abraham had, and God as Yahweh, which is the revelation that Moses received. And in due course, say during the Babylonian captivity around 586 BC, uh, you know, it became no longer tenable <clears throat> to subscribe to different uh, ideas of, of God, as well as the idea that God's authority is confined only to a particular geographical territory. For example, if the God of Israel has jurisdiction only over the territory of Palestine, what happens to the Jews when they are taken into captivity and taken out of Palestine into Babylon? <clears throat> by Nebuchadnezzar. So it's very interesting to note that the idea of a universal God comes into being through the extreme suffering of a people through their physical as well as uh, uh, political dislocation from the familiar context. <clears throat> why, why is it so? It is so because the one thing that no people want to change voluntarily is the idea of God that they inherited from their forefathers. Now, if all of us are honest with ourselves, we know that nothing about our understanding of God has been sought and found by us. Everything has been handed down to us. And that's the main reason why our idea of God and our experience of God remains very vague. Now, as a teacher for 43 years, I kept the words of Galileo as one of my guiding lights. <coughs> Galileo <coughs> used to insist that a person or a people understood only what they discovered for themselves. What you simply hear from others, you never understand. You never engage with it. You never build a personal relationship of intimacy with whatever is simply borrowed from others. That is why we say that our relationship God has to be a personal encounter mere hearsay will not do. But when a person is conditioned in religiosity from birth onwards and spoon-fed everything about the nature of God, as is the case with Christians, there is a serious problem there which we don't face. The problem is that no individual is granted the freedom to search, to discover, to encounter and to experience God for himself or herself. Now, take the case of Moses. Moses' real spiritual life begins with a personal encounter in the field of Midian as he was minding the sheep of his father in law Jethro with God. And it is in the course of that personal encounter that God reveals to Moses as Yahweh. And from that onward, that, from that moment onwards, Moses' life, even the quality of his personality changes. So this kind of life transforming encounters or experiences are very few and far between in the life of Christians. I'm simply positing a problem. I'm not going to say more about it. But let me come back to the idea I introduced at the outset, namely that in the Old Testament context, as well as in other contexts, and in the non judaic context, only when a people are subjected 
say by political historical forces, to unbearable suffering, as in the case of the destruction of the Palestine uh, um, uh, habitat of the Jews, and they're exiled from there into Babylon. They're having to live in captivity and experience the trauma of having to live under foreign subjection. And which is very acute in the case of a people who believed that they had a very special calling from God. After all, the Jews believed themselves to be a chosen race. So these special assumptions or privileges aggravate us anguish when things go wrong. And Jew, the Jews as a whole experienced this uh, unbearable anguish when they were taken into captivity in Babylon. And it is reflected in the psalm, which begins like this, by the rivers of Babylon, there I sat and wept. Right? And of course, this is turned into a beautiful hymn by a musical group called Bornean. By the rivers of Babylon. It goes like that, okay? Uh, I, one day I'll request my friend George to sing that for us. He has a, has a gift of music. So now keep that in the back of mind. There's a great deal more to be said about the Old Testament idea of God. Let me now take leave of that, come straight to the New Testament God and uh, the two, New Testament idea of God or God as revealed by Jesus. This is to begin with an extremely <sighs> important moment in the spiritual history of humankind. It is significant not only for Christians, it is significant for the entire human race. I don't say this in a kind of triumphalistic sense. I say this because the freedom for human beings to understand God as one's Father in heaven and to relate to God accordingly, who till then was considered unapproachable in his terrible majesty, the mysterious, tremendous and fascinating majesty as the German writer Rudolf Otto described it. Mysterious, tremendous, and fascinating, right? So uh, for human beings to be given this kind of privilege to know God as one who can be related in a personal way was something unheard of before. It never ex uh, existed before, and it has not really happened ever since. So it is a watershed moment in the spiritual history of humankind. So please make a note of this. So Jesus, for the first time in human history, reveals God as our Father in heaven. So from the idea of God as a mighty and irresistible warrior in the Old Testament, which was a principal uh, light in which Elohim or El Shaddai uh, was seen by uh, the Jews, we come a very, very long way when we think of God as our loving Father in heaven. Now, surely you can see immediately that there is something that we may call a paradigm shift, a foundational shift. And the shift is from power to love. The main attribute of God in the Old Testament is power. The main attribute of God in the New Testament is love. And this is perhaps the most significant shift in the history of humankind. Um, if you look at the political domain, if you look at the history of humankind, look at the history of wars, history of human subjection, cruelties, exploitation, etc. You find that all these things are symptomatic of a way of life which is structured on power. As long as humankind is organized in terms of power, worldly power, the power of man, <clears throat> then atrocities, cruelties, injustice, oppression, domination, subjugation, all these things are inevitable. That is why when Jesus, um, when he talks to his disciples, 
uh, around the time of his crucifixion, he says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. See, the hypocrisy of the world is that it pre preaches peace or promises peace, but prepares for war all the time. Because as all philosophers that I have read from Plato down to our times, not, that is down to the 20th century, the last one being Anna Herald, has said without exception that the one unavoidable element in organizing human beings at any level, especially the most unavoidable element in international relations, is the element of war. War is necessary. War is unavoidable. Why? Because human beings know to organize themselves only through power. Who is it that we respect most in this world? Those who wield power especially the power to hurt us. People are not popular, not on the scale of their beneficial disposition towards us. People are respected and accepted by us on the scale of the danger that they hold for us. You look at the political domain in India, I don't have to offer any further argument. On the other hand, what is the message of the cross? The message of the cross is that if you love human, human beings, either as individuals or as groups or as nations, they will crucify you. Okay? The paradox of human nature is that on the one hand, we all thirst for love. And on the other hand, we feel suffocated by love. The reason for this is that... <coughs> From the beginning of the organized existence of humankind in history, everything about the corporate or collective life of human beings has been organized in terms of power. You know, the 18th century British empirical philosopher, um, uh, Hume, he said, you know, you can you can conclude any number of international peace treaties. But all peace treaties are mere words and words and words unless you have the power of the sword. The only language that people in the world will understand is the language of power. America is respected worldwide not because America is the most ethical country in the world, or spiritual uh, uh, light in the world, but because it has enormous capacity to destroy, to, to, to spell doom and destruction. And this is something that uh, Vladimir Putin uh, covets and therefore he flexes his muscles where he can. China's great ambition is to outrival uh, USA, so on and so forth. If you look at the affairs of the world, you will see the one element that dominates everything about human beings is lust for power. Okay, now if that is understood, then, then you can understand the revolutionary nature of what Jesus came to inaugurate in history, namely to effect a paradigm shift from the love of power to the power of love. A paradigm shift from the love of power to the power of love. Okay, so this is, and therefore, correspondingly, the idea of God is revealed, and we re read it in very simple, direct, and explicit words of the episode of John God is love. God is love. Okay, uh, so. Now, Hinduism defines God as truth. God is truth. Because Gandhiji would take it up and say the truth is God. Buddhism defines God as compassion. The main attribute of God in the old uh, in the Islamic in Islamic thought is conducive to the idea 
that world Islam is one brotherhood. So that's also the reason why they're quite uh, opposed to uh, giving any kind of physical material representation to God. Because the moment you give a material representation to God, what you do is you connect and, and, and confine God to a particular region or a particular people. And from that time onwards, quarrels start about God. Okay, This is why many of the bloodiest wars in history were all wars fought in the name of God and for the sake of God, though God is love. Okay, So these are some of the conundrums that we see. Uh, in. Now, um, here again, there is a political context to this new revelation of the nature of God. Like in the case of Babylonian captivity, paving the way for the emergence of a monotheistic understanding of God, God as the hybrid of Elohim and Yahweh. Because of the political turmoil and the spiritual anguish that the Jews experienced in, the, in Babylonian captivity, we have an ex a very similar situation prevailing at the time of Jesus. That this very, this very special people were conquered by Rome and they were vassals to Rome. Roman writ ran over the Jews. And for them it is a particularly painful thing to be under the domination of a Gentile king. Because the Jews were used to thinking of God as their king. So, within this political crisis, which is also for Jews, a political crisis is also a spiritual crisis. It became necessary to understand the nature of God in a new light. Now, if you think of Mahatma Gandhi and his political struggles, why he resorted to non-violence? It was sheer pragmatism. There is no way Gandhi could have taken on the, the muscular might of the British Raj, defeated them in battle, and secured the freedom of India. Gandhi had to approach the problem or the fight from another angle. And that angle was completely contrary to the characteristic strengths of the British Empire, which was physical might. Okay. So, Gandhiji therefore confronted the physical might of the British Raj with the strength of the spirit. In his own words, character and soul force. These are the exact words he used. Confronted the British Raj with character and soul force. It was this that mesmerized the British because they did not know quite how to cope with this. And this is something that say, Richard Attenborough in his film on Gandhi tries to present now and then, particularly in the trial scene in the court, the kind of um, uh, confusion and the kind of say uh, uncertainty, lack of self-control that the judges presiding over the trial of Gandhi experiences as Gandhi enters the courtroom. So, uh, now why I'm saying this is that we are now gradually moving into a situation where political changes in India could plunge us into extreme spiritual crisis. And I'm surprised and in fact pained that leaders of the Christian community are sleeping over this. I mean, I quite, I leave a large enough margin for the fact that ultimately God governs the course of history. But even so, it makes some sense to be aware of historical developments and to prepare oneself for the challenges lying ahead. Right? So, what will happen, say, after Hindu Rashtra is established and Christians and Muslims, according to the theoretical framework of India as Hindu Rashtra, 
are reduced from their status as citizens to the status of what's called state subjects or outside the protection of constitutional provisions. Imagine such a situation and its many, many facets, including if you really interpret that change in light of various acts that already exist, the fact that you may not even have the right to decide where you should live. You may not have the right to own wealth more than two lakh rupees. That's as per existing laws in this country. You will not be entitled to your passport. Surely you will not be entitled to voting. And already there was a, a meeting happened in Varanasi by the Hindu Dharam Sansad calling for the establishment of the Hindu Rashtra and emphasizing in particular that Christians and Muslims should be denied citizenship and voting rights. But these are all uh, being talked about. I'm not saying that tomorrow it's going to hit us like an avalanche, but this, this is very much in the air and it, does, it, it makes some sense to be aware of it. I mean, and not to be aware in order to uh, sort of succumb to fear and paralysis, but to see what can be done and how best we can prepare ourselves. So the point is that when a crisis comes, either we can collapse in the wake of it, or we can allow the crisis to be a crucible, a furnace of new possibilities, newer understanding, deeper experiences, and greater achievements in course of time. By the way, there is a good reason why the Jews are the most talented race in the world. And that reason is nothing but the fact that no people group, no race has suffered as much and, as, as, and for as long as the Jews have done. You know, for example, that they have been a diasporic people. They have been scattered over the face of the earth for nearly 2000 years. And wherever they have been, when barring India, they were persecuted. And the persecution of Jews in Europe is a story by itself. It's not merely in the Holocaust, the, uh, Hitler's Holocaust, that the Jews suffered. Jews suffered everywhere in Europe. So uh, suffering deepens in people and suffering awakens possibilities in human geniuses that otherwise a comfortable normal way of life <coughs> would never awaken. <coughs> so, um, Jesus brought this new revelation about the nature of God, God as our Father in heaven, in the context of this un unbearable political spiritual anguish that the Jews were suffering on account of their subjection to the yoke of Roman authority, against which the Jews have been periodically revolting with dire consequences. And we know, for example, that by AD 70, the uh, Romans had, have had enough of this Jewish irritation. So they unleashed a huge reprisal and a large number of Jews were massacred. Uh, and the Jews who sought refuge in the Temple of Jerusalem were butchered. And the Temple of Jerusalem, which was a pride for the Jews, was raised to the ground. And that was when the Jews lost their homeland for the next two millennia. So these are all very profound uh, and painful events. And surely, when a people undergo these experiences, they leave a huge impact, enduring impact on the people. And it's important and very instructive to try and understand it as best we can, but hopefully we'll do it in the course of time. So it is in contradistinction to this that Jesus posits or Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God. Now you have therefore two things. It's very, it's beautiful. It's very symmetrical. On the one hand, you have the, the, the Roman Empire, presumably exercising its authority over the whole of the known world. Well, it's an exaggeration, but it's an exaggeration of the truth. At least three continents uh, were covered by the Roman Empire at that time. That on the one hand, and on the other, 
Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God, which is also universal. So now you must understand why there is a correlation between political imperialistic universality and spiritual universality. So it was no longer valid, it was no longer meaningful to hold on to the Jewish ethnocentric uh, obsessions because they were all dashed to pieces by the hands of history. It's only when the old is so brutally destroyed that the new is born. Okay? And this is the main reason why it is because this suffering is not accept acceptable to us that we all shrink from the prospect of newer revelations ever reaching us. So uh, that's something uh, I thought I would just flag and then let's move on. So what does it mean? Now let's ask, what does it mean to recognize God as our Father in heaven? So far we have seen that the great spiritual revolution that Jesus introduced in contrast to the Old Testament idea of God, which in itself is dynamic and changing, is the shift from God as the great warrior to God as the loving father in heaven. So now the question arises, what does it mean to believe in, uh, believe in this new revelation? To recognize God as our father, father in heaven, is to shift from the external to the internal. Now, if you recognize God as a warrior, you will remain completely obsessed with the external. Now, look at the political um, uh, domain. Politics has no internality. Politics is purely external. So when we say, or if anyone says, that the church is becoming political, what it means is precisely what Jesus meant when he condemned the priests of his days as whited sepulchre. What does that phrase mean? It means that the only relevant thing about the priesthood of his days is their external appearance. Internally, they are either a vacuum or rotting. There is nothing of value within. Whereas the shift or the change of the revolution that Jesus came to introduce was a shift from the external to the internal. I tell you the, uh, the reason why this we must understand very clearly. And particularly because we are living in a, today in an age and in a culture which is purely, purely driven by externalities. If you really pause for a moment and consider your life, or as consider my life, we will see that everything about our life is influenced by and is uh, pegged on what is external to us. Uh, for example, from the if you go back in history and from the time of your early formation, consider the investments made in your life in terms of time, in terms of money, in terms of effort, in terms of education. 99.99% was all in the external world. We have made little investments in our in internal life. And this was the case even during Jesus' times, and that's the reason why in the course of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches that we should gather our treasures where the thief cannot steal, the moth cannot rust. Right? And where is that? It is internal. That which is within you, no thief can steal. No pickpocket can alienate it from you. No passages, passage of time can cause it to rot, uh, rust or rot. Okay? So there's a clear emphasis on the need to shift from the external to the internal. Now, what is our wealth? How do we understand our, health, our wealth? How do we understand beauty? 
how do we understand the worth of a human being how do we understand peace how do we understand security how do we understand happiness so on and so forth so we have not really followed up on this revolutionary reorientation that jesus brought about we are we are stuck in the pre jesus era where everything is mere externalities all right now for example in the second chapter of mark's gospel in relation to the healing of the paralytic we read that jesus sensed the inner thoughts of the pharisees in that context likewise in luke chapter 7 we read that jesus sensed the inner rumbling of simon the pharisee <clears throat> why was it possible for jesus to sense what's going on in the inner <coughs> world of individuals because jesus is the embodiment of human interiority the problem with religion is that religion is always whether you like it or not is always organized in terms of pure externalities there's a reason why the costumes are so important signs and symptoms uh, symbols are so important you know the way something is done is important the grandeur of the church is important the showing of wealth and influence is so important actually whatever is prestigious about our churches pertains to mere externality externalities so in that sense all churches are pre christian so it is time for us to realize that if we acknowledge god as our father in heaven it entails the responsibility to accept the reorientation from the external to the internal now one important aspect of this must be now mentioned now that is in relation to jesus as the liberator remember in the nazareth manifesto that is luke chapter 4 verse 18 jesus says i i have come to set the captives free now i'm sure all of you realize that the more we are dependent on factors external to us the more enslaved we become for the reason it's very obvious it is simple logic you cannot control anything external to yourself whatever is external to yourself exists in a world over which you have absolutely no control and therefore if you are building a life strategy or a way of life depending mainly on external objects you are doing something similar to building a house on shifting foundations okay now this is a reason why the spiritual discipline always encourages individuals to create and enhance it their inner equilibrium their inner points of coherence stability you know i'm sure you have come across people who are like the chameleon even the way they talk depends on the company they are in the ideas they endorse shift by the hour the very flavor of their personality if they have their personality at all changes according to the occasion and if you try to touch something concrete about them you actually grasp emptiness there's nothing inside of them they are mere vacuum encased in a sack of skin and this is the worst condemnation possible in the case of a human being 
And the more we are in the state of inner bankruptcy and powerlessness or, 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 or disequilibrium, the more desperate we become to attach ourselves to some source of stability external to us, but it doesn't exist. You know, John Milton in his poem, Paradise Lost, gives a good example of this. And this is how actually he presents the satanic. He says, imagine a ship which lost itself on a, uh, in the night on the sea, a night foundered skiff, skiff is a ship. <coughs> So, you know, the, 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 the travelers aboard are highly worried, they panic and all that, but soon enough, they see an island. They spot an island, so they become very, very uh, reassured. And uh, the captain uh, uh, brings the ship close to this presumed island. The passengers alight, they are quite, uh, uh, you know, assured of their safety and it's cold. They kindle a little fire and they try to warm their hands in the fire. And as this fire begins to intensify, the whole thing sings. It was a Leviathan, the sea monster. The Leviathan becomes in Miltonic symbolism, the, uh, 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 an embodiment of the satanic, the arch deceiver. Okay. But the point, of course, is that um, it is not only that some external force deceives us. In the, uh, you know, the, if you remember a discussion we had in the previous course about the satanic, and I said to my good friend Dr. Banerjee, I said, "Why don't you spare uh, the poor old fellow Satan for a moment? Don't heap all the responsibilities on him." I was making up the point that. Satan does not have to tempt us. We tempt ourselves. We make ourselves vulnerable to deception and exploitation by shifting all our trust on something external to us, other than God, of course. Okay? Well, you can, of course, now uh, pursue this line of thought and apply it to specific context. Then you will see the relevance of what I have. I have just said. So, my point, therefore, is that if you really cherish your personal freedom, if you value your integrity as a human being, if you want to preserve your self-respect, you have to outgrow this habit of building your life on external props. This is why Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. This is also why Paul when he writes to Corinthians, says, Know ye not, don't you know, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Tremendous power indwells you. You choose to be conspiratorially unaware of this. You are deliberately turning against yourself. You deny this power within you. And you go and look for all kinds of straws, straws to clutch and clasp. It's a terrible state. Now, this kind of obsequious dependence on others, fellow human beings, simply because they happen to occupy some chairs or show off some costume, etc. I mean, it's, it's something that really denigrates human beings. It's, an, it's, it's a self-insult we heap on ourselves. I mean, I don't want to go more into it. It's a very serious issue. Please pay some thought to this. Therefore, the first implication of... <coughs> Acknowledging that Jesus brought about a shift in the understanding of God from being the, uh, say, the irresistible warrior to a loving Father in heaven is that we shift the focus of our personal life from the external to the internal. I so say in Hindi, mandir actually means man ka andar that which is inside your mind. So even in Hinduism, it is acknowledged that the only place where you can meet with God is in your, within yourself. Instead, we have somehow imbibed this rather stupid notion that God dwells only in churches, mosques and uh, temples and gurudwaras. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievably uh, uh, unenlightened, crude, 
stupid. Okay, so it's all because we have completely rejected the mission of Jesus Christ, and we deliberately hold on to an outlook which is pre-Christ. That's why we say that we are pre-Christian pagans rather than followers of Jesus Christ. The second. No, uh, before I leave, take leave of this, let me also give you a reference. In the conversation between Jesus and the woman of Samaria, Jesus says, and you find it in the 24th verse of the fourth chapter of John's Gospel, he says, it's a passage that all of us go by heart. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, right? And that worshiping him in spirit and truth is then connected to the idea that God does not dwell on this mountain or that mountain. If God doesn't dwell on this mountain or that mountain, where does he dwell? He dwells within you. Okay? So, anyway, uh, furthermore, there's a great deal more to be said about it. Let's move on. The second major implication in accepting this reorientation is that it puts the emphasis on, or we recognize the importance of building a personal relationship to God. Not a doctrinal, parochial, uh, establishment-oriented, orthodox, distant uh, relationship with God. But a relationship, you see, as Soren Kierkegaard was so fond of saying, a relationship in which the individual stands alone before his maker. And nothing in between. And Kierkegaard was particularly keen, and in fact, I, I, some of you would know, I grew under his inf grew up under his influence in my early formation <coughs> uh, as, a, as a young academic. So Kierkegaard says that no mediator is allowed or legitimate between us and God. Every mediator is an intruder. But as Jesus, the word use, Jesus uses in the 10th chapter of Luke, John's Gospel, it's a hireling who creeps in through the back door. If God, if God is our Father in heaven, how many mediators and what kind of mediators do we need to relate to our Father, Father in heaven? How many mediators do you use to relate to your uh, earthly fathers? Five, 10, 20? Huh? Do you talk to your earthly father in all kinds of stylized forms before you have a conversation, before before your father comes along uh, and you notice him, uh, you, you say, Dad, please wait at me, put on my formal official costume. Huh? Let me stand in a particular manner, like a frozen specimen of humanity. Then I say, Dad, how are you? That's how it is. We have to be extremely unnatural. We cannot be human in our awareness of God and extremely artificial, unnecessarily convoluted uh, way of relating to God has been created as though God cannot understand anything and, we, and God is most reluctant to accept us. We have to use all kinds of, you know, devious methods and hypnotic techniques and flatteries and you know, uh, light and sound delusions and delusions in order to create an atmosphere favorable to us. And nobody realizes that this is really ridiculously funny. You think of Jesus' relationship with God the Father. Show me one element of contrived artificiality or formal obeisance or a kind of, uh, you know, what shall I say, artificiality, theatricality, in anything that he mentions about God. The supreme moment in the Gospels is the 30th verse of the 10th chapter of John's Gospel when he says, I and my father are one. If you and your father are one, how many mediators? But unfortunately, because of our worldly conditioning, we cannot imagine a situation in which there aren't mediators. After all, mediators are there in the commercial world. 
we don't buy any of the products from factories direct from factory outlets it comes to us through many many mediators okay and then we of course pay for it whether it is in industry commerce or in religion we have to pay for mediators i mean that is something so as paul tillich used to argue that the only mediator legitimate in the christian spiritual context is jesus as the mediator and he in fact says that jesus is the necessary mediator and of course he bases his argument on jesus's affirmation that no one comes to the father except through me but of course paul tillich gives to this a wider interpretation and says that jesus must be the necessary mediator in all our relationships interpersonal relationships family relationships social relationships relationships in the workplace so on and so forth it is not that we relate to another human being wherever there is a relationship jesus exists in the interpersonal space as the necessary mediator that's the idea of paul tillich so uh, our relationship with god becomes direct and therefore we are delivered from the need <coughs> to depend on mediators please understand that whether it is in science or in the world of letters or in historiography or in religion all mediums distort a medium which does not distort does not exist absolutely not so if you let mediators between you and god you will never relate to god you will relate to what the the intermediary says is god and there's no way you can find out whether the idea of god that you derive through the intermediary connects at any point in any way to the truth about god okay let me leave that rules now the third aspect or third implication of knowing god as, as our father in heaven is that we shift from a morality of prescription and pressure to the morality of aspiration i'll explain that in a little while so if you look at the old testament morality it is purely the morality of prescription and pressure wherever there is prescription there is pressure there is compulsion do this don't do that do this don't do that do and those do and those do and those but that doesn't exist in the new way of life that jesus brought it is not the morality of prescription it's a morality of aspiration and that's why jesus says be perfect even as your father in heaven is perfect he also said that he who believes in me will do not only what i have done but greater things than i have done okay so the, this is the morality of aspirations when jesus says if you have faith as large as a mustard seed we'll ask this mountain to move and it will it's a morality of aspiration okay but this is very little to do with our life as christians because i tell you why because the morality of aspiration cannot be prescribed and preached can only be embodied that's the significance of the incarnation the morality of aspiration is incarnational not prescriptive Now, let me make this distinction a little clear i please listen to me now very carefully so there are two types of moral moralities in the world the first genre or the first kind of morality is made up of rules and regulations for example simply by growing up in a particular society you will acquire you will imbibe 
the do's and don'ts of that society. And if you don't conform to those do's and don'ts, the society will punish you according as it deems fit. So that's the morality of prescription. Now, this morality of prescription exists and can exist only in the form of rules and regulations. Let's make it very clear. But that is not the way Jesus approached things. What did he do? As John says in chapter 1, verse 14, the word became flesh. The word did not become a hundred rules. or hundreds of regulations and sub-regulations at which the Pharisees and the Sadducees were great experts. Jesus came, as John says in that wonderfully moving uh, verse, to dwell in our midst full of grace and truth. So this aspirational morality which Jesus embodied cannot be a matter of do's and don'ts, but it has to be a matter of emulation. That's why Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. You learn a thousand do's and don'ts, you will come nowhere near this way of life. And St. Augustine understood it somewhat, and that's why he said, love God and do as you please. Because if you love God, then your personality assumes a very, very safe orientation, a very dynamic orientation. You remember, I spent a lot of time on the difference between static and dynamic religiosities. All that is relevant here, in fact, I'm building up these insights and arguments in a graded fashion. So if, uh, if you don't recall what I said, I have always, I'm not going to repeat what is already covered, but they all coexist. So if you're familiar with what has been covered, then what is being said becomes simpler and clearer, more readily accessible. So they said, uh, so in the case of this new paradigm of morality, personal relationship is very important. It was not so important than the old paradigm where simply knowledge of rules and regulations was sufficient. Now, in this context, in order to make it very this very important principle clear, and today only I have, we have five more minutes left, let me let me bring, uh, use a biblical illustration. Let's focus on it clearly so that we can understand it better. Let me take a very familiar example: the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, there is an expert in Jewish law. Now. If you look at that character, you will know what the representative of the old school of morality actually is like. He knows all the rules and regulations. He knows all the commandments. But his knowledge is of no use. Love your neighbor as yourself. He knows it by heart. But then he says, who is my neighbor? Now, of what consequence is it, my friends, that you know that you have to love your neighbor, but you do not know if you have a neighbor at all? So what you know in theory, you destroy in practice. So the end result is zero. So this representation is very profound. I, I don't think... I don't think the profundity of the uh, parable of the sermon, on the, uh, parable of the Samaritan, has been properly uh, interpreted. I'll try and do that uh, by and by. Now, the contrast. So, so why does Jesus, why does Jesus create within the parable the Pharisee and the Levite, because they are representatives. They are the counterparts of the Jewish. Uh, expert, the expert in Jewish law. Okay? So the Pharisee and the Levite, the priest and the Levite, belong to the same school of thought, the same paradigm of morality. They know everything, but the end result is zero. Now, let me ask you, 
all our churches organize a lot of conventions and revival meetings and crusades, etc. On the assumption, which is laughable, that people do not know. Everybody knows. There is nothing that anybody is learning in you. Let me say this to you. We're fooling ourselves by thinking that people attending these uh, conventions and crusades get something new each time they go there. The same material is being recycled endlessly, endlessly. But nothing changes on the ground. The sum total of the effect of all that we are doing is zero. You must ask the question, why is it so? Now, it is because the empowerment to put what we know in theory into practice can never be derived from the knowledge of laws and regulations. Is that clear? I'll repeat. Very important that you realize this. You see, you have some knowledge, okay? You know what to do and what not to do. The question is, having known what is right and what is wrong, how, from where do you get the strength and the motivation to do what is right and avoid what is wrong? Can you derive that from law? Can you derive that from rules and regulations? No, you can't, because law is powerless. And that there, Paul's writings on the limitations of law are perfectly valid. Paul has an inspired understanding of the powerlessness of law in enabling individuals to live according to the light that they have received. Okay? So, in the new understanding, therefore, the emphasis shifts from knowledge of ethical, moral norms, rules, and regulations to building a personal relationship with Jesus in whom aspirational morality is incarnated. That is, that is the meaning of saying, be imitators of Christ. There is much more to be said on this, but today, Time is up. I'll close. I will. Uh, I will conclude today's discussion here. <laughs> we can have. <clears throat> we can have a time of uh, discussion now. Particularly if there is anything that I've said which is not clear, which is quite likely that there is, uh, please bring them up. I'm happy to explain to the extent that I can. Anyone with uh, any difficulties? Do you more? Do you need more time to recover from the session? <laughs> That's an I have a question. Yes. Sir. What do you What do you said? There's a lot of. Uh, uh, deep understanding and information. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much about it, Rachel. Well, particularly when you said that <laughs> enactment of law and enforcing of law will never will never refine a person or society. We need the skill to transform it into actions. This is a part of jurisprudence also in law. We, we study that by enacting legislation, and intensifying punishment, you can never eliminate the criminal intent from a society that is always there. An unscrupulous mind will always find some method or the other to short circuit whatever law you bring in. If we assume that to be correct, my question is, why did God give the Ten Commandments to Moses first? Knowing pretty well that that law is not going to reform our inner mind, inner Yes. Uh, uh, prescriptions and uh, uh, pressures that you said instead of aspirations. And I, I'm very particularly happy that Jesus has reduced the whole enactment into simple two truths. Yes, Absolutely. love me, love God, love people. That's all simple. 
Yes. Why was this law given in the first instance? That's right. Now, this if is that the reason. Could it reform the yes, society. Thank you. thank you, George. As usual, a very, very central and relevant question, and uh, the group as a whole is appreciative of what you have contributed. Uh, now, uh, this is why I have been trying to emphasize the dynamic, which also means the changing nature of our spiritual understanding within the Judeo-Christian tradition. Okay, for example, but uh, what happens? What happens among uh, among Christians is, particularly among the more orthodox Christians, this particular process is totally denied. And everything is assumed to be frozen in time. Therefore, all we have to do is to somehow learn by rote, learn by rote the things that happened in the distant past. <clears throat> now, why the Ten Commandments? Now, you notice <coughs> that the Ten Commandments are given to the people in the course of their journey from the land of slavery to the land of promise. So it's obviously a transitional phase. See, when a people move from one context to another, there is a period of transition. Now, when they were in Egypt, the Jews did exist, and because they had to exist in a kind of syncretistic state. Many of them compromised with the Egyptian culture, Egyptian idea of God, Egyptian religion, Egyptian rituals, practices, etc. And at the same time, their predicament there was that of slavery. Now a radical shift is taking place in their predicament, namely from being slaves, they are being led into freedom. So at this, in this period, in this wonderful process of liberation from one state to another, from state of bondage, external bondage to a state of uh, uh, external freedom, certain guiding principles are necessary. But those guiding principles are not the be all and end all of humankind's spiritual destiny. They are the means and one basic problem in man's practice of religion is that means are always exalted as ends. That which is given as an instrument is turned into the destination, the ultimate goal. For example, take the idea of the church. Archbishop William Temple uh, one of the more enlightened archbishops England ever produced. He said the church is the only institution in the world founded for the benefit of its non-members. In other words, he said that the church is a signpost to something beyond itself. Okay? But that's not the way in which we understand church. We understand our loyalty to church as deeming the church as the ultimate destination. Don't go beyond that one bit. So that is what I mean by saying that we turn means into ends, tools into goals. Okay? And this is where all the problems lie. So in the case of uh, uh, the Ten Commandments, these rudimentary laws were necessary to guide the process of transition from one state to another. But the next stage in the evolution of humanity is already included in this because certainly from their life in Egypt to the next phase of living in Canaan, the land of promise, there's a huge shift. And the Ten Commandments are the nodal guiding points or guiding lights in that shift. Now the point is, if there is one shift, there will be another shift. See, the problem with us is that we are willing to accept one change, but we will not accept any change thereafter. For example, Church of North South India was formed out of the amalgamation of six different traditions, six different churches or six denominations. And when it was formed and inaugurated in 1947, it was widely acclaimed 
that it will remain a united and uniting church. United and uniting church. Uniting. What happened to the uniting part of it? Finished. Why? Because the moment the church was formed and church came into existence, it became an end in itself. You take any aspect of organized religiosity, whether it is Christianity, Islam, into any religion for that matter, there is no difference in this respect between religions. You find that what is given as the proximate resource <coughs> becomes the ultimate resource. Proximate means something given for a particular purpose. It is not forever valid, but for the time being, ad hoc, for the time being. Okay? So what that which is of proximate value is then mistaken for the ultimate, and people are then persecuted if they look beyond the proximate, mistaking it to be the ultimate. So this is what happens. So, yes, the Ten Commandments had their relevance, but now that a new revelation has come into the human predicament through Jesus Christ, it becomes necessary to transcend the Ten Commandments, which are also, as I said, in the prescriptive mode of ethics, not in the aspirational mode of ethics. Do's and don'ts, do's and don'ts. <coughs> so, uh, Jesus then, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, you find Jesus consciously transcending the limits of Mosaic law. After all, the Ten Commandments were given through Moses. Whether the Ten Commandments were indeed given in with, uh, the way in which it is it is portrayed in films, you know, a tongue of flame coming and hitting a tablet of stone and carving this letter and that letter, I mean, uh, highly dramatic uh, versions of it, whether that's the way in which it happened, whether Moses was given a mystical experience of uh, revelation and he noted down these things. We do not know really. I mean, we have an account of it in the book of Exodus. <coughs> we, uh, we are told that he came down from the top of the mountain carrying these two tablets on which the Ten Commandments were inscribed. <coughs> so, um, uh, 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 George is absolutely right. Uh, oh, um, if, the, if the Ten Commandments <coughs> were to be transcended, why, would, why were they given in the first place? They were given uh, only to be transcended because if, if you imagine a people to be evolving, if you imagine history to be a continuous flow forward, then you also realize that there are a series of nodal points through which cha <coughs> changes must be mediated. And change means at every point or every station of change, that which was uh, held to be valid till then get superseded. Now you look at you look at the domain of science. So many of you are scientists. Um, Zach is a doctor and Anne is a doctor. Now, in the field of medicine, for example, it's possible to look at various nodal events in the evolution of medical sciences. Um, you had certain assumptions holding the field as the ultimate in their times. And soon enough, they changed. Great, breathtaking, miraculous discoveries, right? One is superseded by another. So now, can, is it possible for us to say that why, why did uh, the X-ray have to be invented? Because in course of time, MRI will come and replace it. No, the X-ray had its place at a certain phase in the evolution of medical sciences. The X-rays did their, did their part. They were useful, they were relevant, but, but a time came when because of increasing medical knowledge and perhaps because of decreasing the sensitivity and the uh, spiritual sensitivity of medical practitioners, uh, the accuracy of diagnosis made possible based on X-ray results uh, proved to be insufficient or unsatisfactory. And therefore, further perfections in diagnostic technology had to be aimed at and were achieved, and that's a great thing. 
So uh, at, at various stages, we have these markers of uh, progress and breakthroughs in medical science. The same thing applies to uh, every every other field of knowledge which is progressing uh, continually. Okay. Uh, I hope I hope that uh, makes some sense, uh, George. Atan, I must say I, I must admit that is precisely what I needed the explanations. Most a prompt and valid one. Thank you so much. I feel a lot relaxed. Just to know that uh, it was only a transitional or a, as you said, an oral guiding principle. Yes. Until it was repeated. Pramdi, it's also, it's also a watershed moment, uh, anticipatory, uh, uh, proleptic of the work of Jesus Christ. Hmm? Because in, in, in biblical symbolism, Christ is, uh, sorry, Moses is seen as a prototype of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, G, uh, Moses is the lawgiver. In the New Testament, Jesus is the giver of the new law. So there is a symbolic connection between the two. But the connection is also one of dynamic progress on account of which the insights revealed by Moses had to be transcended by the new revelation or, as I said, the paradigm shift from prescriptive ethics to aspirational ethics as embodied in Jesus Christ. Okay? Where you have to shift from doing what is right through external compulsion or a sense of obligation to doing what is right spontaneously from within. So that doing right becomes an expression of personal freedom. Whereas in the old model, it was personal obligation. You see the subtle difference? In the old model, doing what was right, avoiding what was wrong, was a matter of personal obligation. I'm using a very correct word, obligation. Whereas in the new model, in the kingdom of God, embodied in, uh, or unveiled by Jesus Christ, doing what is right and righteous becomes a spontaneous self-expression, an expression in personal freedom. So it is you do what is right, not because you're obliged to do so, but because it is your aspiration to be perfect. Okay? It makes a huge difference. Though in language it looks very simple or subtle or small, natural practice it becomes... The, different, uh, uh, the difference is as huge as the difference between day and light, day, day and night. Yeah. All right. Any other question? In, 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 Wilson, in understanding God as the father of mankind, uh, father in heaven, yeah. indicates the brotherhood and sisterhood of mankind yeah. too, yes, relational Absolutely. Dynamics. Absolutely. There, is, there is a freedom in that yeah. relationship. Yes. And St. Paul, was very careful in saying to the Corinthians, you are temple of God, not temples of God. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So that, is, that, that, that is very, very important in our yes. understanding. Yeah. We made it in temples of God. Yeah, exactly. And there is no unity at all. Yeah. And this is, the, this is the problem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, you need different temples because different deities are to be installed. You know, it's interesting, uh, as you know, these days I've been studying um, the life and work of K.V. Simon. Um, and um, K.V. Simon, um, uh, he wrote uh, several very, very powerful pamphlets, tracts. Because those were the days also of great um, uh, religious apologetics. And because of the growing influence and spread of Christianity, Christianity also came under attack. Uh, you know, people like Chattabhi Swami, people like uh, uh, Muslim, some Muslim thinkers like uh, Maulabi, I forget his name. They wrote very, very damning uh, pamphlets against Christianity. Um, um, so, um, K.V. Simon was also, uh, K.V. Simon joined this, this argument, this process and tried to defend. He was actually the foremost, the leading light of Christian apologetics in his time. Uh, I'm, I'm losing the connection. What, uh, Fra sorry, uh, Zach, what did you say? I Tem Temples, of, Temples of God. Temples. Uh -huh, Temples of God. Now, so, 
uh, uh, this was this was, this was an issue that greatly troubled Simon, K. V. Simon. He said, he said that um, your denominationalism caricatures God. Of course, I mean he got into trouble with the church and all that. I mean that's history. I'm not going to that history. So uh, people who are spiritually sensitive are we're all aware of this in one way or another, but unfortunately. We're not allowed to become more sensitive than, or, or, or to exceed a certain minimum level of sensitivity in these matters and to hold back from going full throttle into an inquiry of this kind, because then the consequences could be, could be deleterious for the viability of the establishment. I mean, uh, Zach is absolutely right in the sense that if you regard God the, as the uh, one minute, one, one more sentence than that. If you regard God as our Father in heaven, then the entire human family become uh, humankind becomes one family, the family of God, and there is this universal sense of brotherhood and sisterhood, and a sense of belonging, a sense of solidarity, human solidarity, that no label, no wall, no separation can ever affect fragment or disable. But as you know, this is a far cry from what we are practicing at the moment. Yes, yes, Alice, yes. Yeah, Alice, your question. Hello. Um, first of all, uh, can I make some comment? Not a question. Yes. Can I make a few comments? Yes, or... yes. Alice, feel free. You say whatever you, you, you think you need to. Your connection, your connection is not very powerful. Um, but uh, we'll manage. We'll manage. Uh. Not really a question. Yes, yes. I want to make a few statements. Yeah, please. One. Yeah. Wonderful message. So I can relate it to the message very well because at this stage in my life, I have a, I'm learning these things through my life experience from the people I'm with. I'm teaching in a Bible college. Wonderful, wonderful. Great. Communication skills. Great, I didn't know this. Wonderful. And God bless you. I have observed, I have observed the points that you have made. Very good. You get me? Yes, yes, please, please carry on. So I could relate please. very well, really very well, very true. And I've been actually touching this point. So I started, I mean, one of the sessions uh, went to the, I've been asking them to know thyself. You know, oh, who great. are you? Yes, yes. Identif yeah. From which they can realize that whether they are just doing things for the sake, what you said, no? Not internal, but external. Yes, yes, exactly. Externally compelled to do certain, be, a, you know, um, so it, your message has been so good for me. I mean, it's uh, reestablished and when I was a teenager, I remember asking um, my parents, I said, my, I, came, I went to a very good school and I was in a very top class and, you know, all the students, my classmates, we were all very good in our studies. Also, we were very good in, in every way. Right. I mean, character, I, we had an excellent, uh, so, um, we stood out, stood out. We, there were Muslims, there were Buddhists, there were Hindus, and me. I came home and told my parents, I'm them. They're just like me. One or two Christians are there. It's not because I'm a Christian. Look at them. They're equally conscious, studying, hardworking, good character, you know, very good homes. So from then I had the question, there must be something more. That's how I started searching. There was a time when I went to college uh, when I came across atheists, wonderful people externally. 
And uh, so I went into deep, I said, I will forget all what I learned, what they told me that I am, I am born as a Christian into a Christian family, and therefore we go to heaven, et cetera, et cetera. That was the things that we were taught when we were a child. So I threw everything out and I said, I'm going to read the Bible myself. Good. Good. That's he's when the, Matthew 7, 21, 22, mm. 23, the Lord's mm. presence. Actually, yes, yes. it was so personal. I, I experienced the personal uh, presence of him and, and realized what a sinner I was inside, not because I did bad things, mm -hmm. but I realized I needed his that point when yeah. I really repented, cried. So this, this is, uh, uh, has been a changing point for me. Yeah. Um, so um, when you, that, that internal, internalizing, yeah. as just as you said, now I face the difficulties where people are focused on external rules, regulations, you know, do this, do that, have to be done. I ask people lots of questions. In fact, one of the assignments I've been given my class, many of them are from non, they've come to Christ from non-Christian homes. So they don't have that background of free. Uh, I told them to go through the gospels to, and take out all the questions just the questions that Jesus has asked. And that's how I also learned. Right. Everywhere, every chapter in the Gospels, wherever Jesus has asked a question, mm -hmm. I've given them this assignment, write the question, then yeah. later go through the answers. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Uh, for me, it was yeah. very amazing. And they are also learning. That very good. Completely a change. Instead of saying, you know, uh, learning that do this, do that, you have to be like this, talk like that. In fact, one of the, I'm teaching English also because they're from okay. a Hindu, Hindi speaking background. Mm -hmm. One girl came up and prayed such a beautiful prayer in English. Uh -huh. And I was amazed, but she can't speak to me in English. But I talked to her, she said, no, I can't. And I said, you prayed so well in English. How was that? She said, when she came for, earlier certificate class, they had to learn to pray in English. Okay. So mm -hmm. you understand what I'm saying, you know? So this is the reality yeah. and I'm facing it. And I thank you. You, you really got sent for me, uh, Achin. I'm, I'm glad. I'm just I'm glad you're doing something like this. I'm, I'm glad you're doing very soulful work. I'm glad many young people are benefiting from it. And I'm, I'm very, very pleased to know that the small little things I contribute uh, are, are helping you in the good work that you're already doing. Okay? That's, that's, that's very gratifying indeed. And thank you for participating I would, I would like so actively. To pray for me. Yeah, sure. Sure. Lovely. Please sure pray God for will me. Bless. I am 72. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I, I, I'm sure that God will use you wonderfully and you will be a blessing in the life of young people uh, whose formation has been entrusted to you and uh, your spirit is right. So, uh, you know, the outcome has to be glorious. Of that, there is no doubt. Okay. You see, the foremost quality that a teacher must have is the passionate eagerness to learn. Fortunately, the good Lord has given you an ample measure of that. And therefore, I'm sure that you will go, go from strength to strength, that you'll shine like a <coughs> guiding light to the lives of young people. Okay? Good. Okay, uh, anyone else Thank with you. a question? Thank you. Thank you, Alice. God bless. Uh, any, anyone else? Okay, we are, uh, I make it 20 minutes, 24 minutes past nine o'clock. And if there are no further questions, usually I get a question from Anne Harrigerson. How about you, my boy? I'm okay, Achan. Thank you very much. I, I, I'm just enjoying the lessons. I'm 
at the learning stage beginning you know i may be the only orthodox uh, man <laughs> listening <laughs> listening and uh, you know i i I'm, um, my eyes are opened and uh, i noticed i am i may be very few not wearing glass i can see things now oh, I- <laughs> wonderful that's that's right thank you very much so thank so you. this is another <laughs> illustration of the principle that i was referring to the fact that you don't have to depend on a pair of glasses <laughs> means that you are you are you are more free than the rest of us are uh, thank you very much see yeah. for us to see clearly you have to depend something external to us depend on something external to ourselves no you are free <laughs> okay that so uh, that um, i notice antonia how are you antonia good thank you wonderful and i wish, wish to thank you for joining in um assuming that there are no further questions shall we then bring the session to a close and i wish you all the best uh, and i look forward to joining back with you a week from now so in the meanwhile the uh, uh, video of today's session will be uploaded and the link will be shared with you by my brother and all thomas and i'm very glad to report that about 300 people are now regularly watching these videos uh, which is uh, which is a matter of great happiness really so uh, you're all participating in this process of generating resources for the <laughs> generations after generations thank you thank you very much Thank you, Achan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Achan. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. I'm missing. And Harry Kirtan is thinking too much today than talking. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I can't even see him. This is okay. Yeah, there's a lot to think about today. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> yeah. If there is anything, you can bring up, bring it up for discussion at, at the next session. Next yeah. time, yes. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Achan. God bless. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye.